creative disruption. This concept that has now become the battle cry of organizations in the digital age was first introduced in 1992 by TBWA's chairman, Jean-Marie Drew. Creative disruption is aimed at exposing flaws in the current business model and highlighting areas where changes are needed. It involves a radical change in the marketplace brought about by the act of demolishing long-standing practices, challenging established norms, and experimenting with the untried and untested. Hello and welcome to ETCIO Leaders Live. I'm Sneha Jha, editor at ETCIO, and your host for the session. We're streaming live right now into LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. My guest today is a long-standing insurance industry veteran. He is Srinivasan Iyengar, COO of Reliance Nippon Life Insurance. In a career spanning 35 years, Mr. Iyengar has worked in IT leadership roles at organizations like Aegon Religair Life Insurance, ICICI Prudential Life Insurance, LIC, and Prudential Services Asia. He joined Reliance Nippon Life Insurance as the COO in 2013. And since then, he has been deeply invested in the digital transformation process of his organization. He owns non-sales functions, including technology, digitization, operations, claims, underwriting, risk, and data analytics for over 720 branches of the life insurer. He has seen the insurance industry from close quarters, and he knows quite well how to leverage technology to pole vault his organization into the digital age. He is a highly awarded, highly admired, and highly regarded business and technology leader in the BFSI industry. Mr. Iyengar, welcome to ETCIO Leaders Live. It's a privilege to have you as my guest today. Thank you for joining Great. us. Thank you, Sneha, and thank you to ETCIO also for inviting me for this session. It's indeed a pleasure to be connected again. Thank you, sir. It's an honor to have you on the show. Mr. Iyengar, insurance at its core is about helping people in crisis, fulfilling their needs through the different stages and the milestones of their journey in life. It's about risk management and minimizing the risk exposure of its customers. So the intention is very noble. But in all honesty, the approach is a bit conservative. Uh, insurance does not have the most inspiring reputation for transformation and bleeding edge innovation. But in today's day and age, this industry is at the cusp of large scale creative disruption through digital. Uh, there's an opportunity to, to reimagine how it works. There's an opportunity to make it relevant to our generation and how we live. There is an opportunity to see this industry through fresh new eyes. So I thought I'd talk to you about how creative disruption is making new pathways in an old industry and how digital led creative disruption ensures that insurance meets its fullness. So let's start off with the top of the mind question for all of us as consumers. Uh, you know, Woody Allen once famously or rather infamously said that there are worse things in life than death. And that is actually spending an evening with an insurance salesman. Now, customers often find insurance confounding. The product is in the form of a promise. It is complex. It is intangible, future focused, and it is steeped in crisis driven situations. So how do you see digital taking the element of complexity out of the insurance equation? And how does digital make insurance easy to understand, easy to buy, and easy to participate in? Let me start with an interesting uh, insight. I'm, I'm sharing this point because you started off by saying in 1992, there was this creative destruction as a terminology brought in. And as a person who is very seeped in a lot of mythological studies, uh, if you look at our own Shiv Puranas, what it talks about is the third eye of Shiv is called as the eye of creative destruction. What it does is where everything has got a life cycle and as it goes to a stage of maturity is when you demolish the whole thing and restart, 
restart of a new tomorrow and a restart mm-hmm. of a new dawn with that let me just uh, get on to the subject that what we are here for uh, insurance uh, yes uh, some of these aren't true uh, insurance traditionally has been probably looked in certain quarters in that way however i would like to say that insurance is not a complex or impossible to understand subject it is like any other financial product the key differentiator of insurance versus some other financial product is that it protects the future for mm. unforeseen specified event which is what sets it unique the word unforeseen specified future event the moment we get into these a certain element of estimation a certain element of hypothesis is uh, inevitable so for example in a life insurance process there are these stages like there is a need analysis on what an insurance cover is needed by an individual what are his life goals that he would like to secure with insurance somebody may have a need for only a life cover someone may like to have life cover and also an element of savings someone may want to just provide for his old age in terms of his annuity and so on what are his what is his present age so these are the factors that naturally requires a certain amount of uh, discussion addressing the queries a certain amount of back and forth before mm-hmm. a sale or sale is concluded or let us say a customer ends in buying the policy traditionally an insurance salesman would have done multiple rounds of discussion with the customer presented to him various quotes then work on what are those if then analysis suggested options and all of this then finally leads to a final sale as you would see here the the number of back and forth is what takes the largest chunk of this whole process and this is where exactly digital came in to do the creative destruction what did it do it ushered in two big transformation which helped in destroying the some of the way in which a particular process was done and replaced it with a faster better accurate set of tools and solutions to enable the whole purchase process more faster more accurate and more enjoyable if i can use the word rather than just saying simple friction less also and seamless indeed now these two major transformation what are they first is assessment and arriving at a right solution much faster and that too at the click of a button on so proper on need analysis bases the life stage requirement of a consumer yes this indicate this whole thing of need analysis what digital did is just using a set of uh variables or set of information that you feed in on real time basis as the seller and the purchaser would have been uh, discussing or if the purchaser buys it directly from the company as he enters this information at a click of a button it enables all of these if then solutions and options made available in a fraction of a second to the customer and also helps in generating scenario the second one is using these if then analysis also being able to do predictive proposition about the product or the various add on that can best be suited for the customer is what is projected now mm-hmm. these are the two key pillars i would say which digital transformation has done in creatively destroying what was otherwise a long process or a perceived complicated product project uh, sorry process and replacing those manual interventions or lot of subjectivity in a more predictive and reliable manner mm-hmm. and most important being on near real time or real time basis 
Right, right. Uh, thank you. So, um, so you've very beautifully illustrated how, uh, what are some of the areas where uh, digital is creating a very strong impact and it is um, sort of rejiggering the way uh, things were perceived in the traditional insurance uh, pattern. Now, uh, insurance industry has been a little complex and had abstruse value propositions. And there's a lot of involvement of paperwork. Uh, there, there were paper-based policies and things like that. So how do you see automation making this uh, antiquated business model stand on its head? How do you see that uh, bringing in an operational efficiency in the processes? Yeah. So firstly, we need to understand, as I said earlier, the whole insurance is the insurance, when I'm saying insurance, uh, a life insurance, for example, is about insuring an uncertain event. The uncertainty could be death. The uncertainty could be accident. Now, when you are insuring an uncertain event, whose ability to convert into reality at a given period of time is not certain, mm -hmm. is when you have to write a risk, it, isn't it? When I am promising okay. to pay something, when I am not able to assess exactly when an event will happen, I have to rely that on various assessment of the risk, which is normally called as underwriting in an insurance world. Mm -hmm. Now, for these, the paperwork that used to be there were always either a financial document or a health-related uh, document or a, a family information-related document, which was enabling to write the risk. What the, the old order and the way digital has helped change is to bring about a seamless integration, not only between the insurance company, the seller and the buyer, but also a huge set of ecosystem of players, whether it be an Aadhaar or whether it be a KYC for like PAN card verification or a DDoP engine across an industry level, variety of these things at a real time, which was earlier not possible, enabling one, a sharper assessment of risk with minimal information. Two, seeking this information without being too much intrusive into the life of the customer, having to make him subject to submitting 100 things. So while the form is being filled up, an other gets authenticated at the back end. While the form is being filled up, a PAN gets authenticated at the back end. Or a medical history is given, that is, Using an AI, you could see whether his answers are in line with what the uh, the previous question and what the next question is and being able to correlate. Now, what happens is this has taken away a huge amount of, uh, if I can use the word, a selected suspicion that you start with, am I writing the right risk? That's taken off with the certainty. This is what the single most uh, benefit the digital disruption or digital transformation has brought about in this industry to move and make it leapfrog from a large paper, multiple document environment to today, many of the companies claiming we are 90% paperless, we are 95% paperless, or some of them even claiming 100% paperless. That's the journey what digital transformation makes it possible. Again, once again, I would like to reiterate the important aspect here is not to take away the essence of what was being done, is to take away the troubles and the obstruction using the entire digital ecosystem of fintech, insurtech, and the third party players to be able to complete the core of insurance underwriting mm -hmm. without having to create additional load on anyone in the system. Okay. All right, so reducing the grant work and making processes and uh, you know methods more efficient is what uh, yes. is, is aimed at. Uh, so, so Mr. Iyengar, you have been at the front end of all digital initiatives at Reliance Nippon Life Insurance. How did you deconstruct your business model and uh, reimagine your business processes, redefine your customer value propositions for the digital age? The first and most important thing when we embarked on some of these initiatives is we looked at all the key focus area 
And when I say key focus area, we re-looked at the whole process end to end from a seller, employee, and a customer perspective. Two very important points here. When people try to, the most common mistake that people do in a digital transformation is look at one small gap and try to bring in automation and assume that the problem is solved. Mm -hmm. It is indeed solved for that gap, but an end-to-end -end is necessarily not solved. Second, mm -hmm. many of these digital transformation focuses on customer. Yes, we do understand we hear words like customer is king, etc. But we have to understand that this is like a triangle where there are three ends customer being at the apex and the two other ends of the triangle being the seller and the uh, employee. And when I say employee is everybody else within the organization who brings it together. Now, it is important to address the end to end process, looking at all the three angles. This is what we did for our key process. Then after we did that, what we did to ensure was create a digital map of this whole journey. Now, when you say digital map, you would find two things that emerges out of it. What is the area that you have a traditional gap which needs to be bridged? Second, what is the area that you need to relook at the way that it is being done? Probably it is not needed now. I will give you a small example. If your process step included that when, an, when a financial document is uploaded and ITR is uploaded, there will be an underwriter who has to check it. Now, maybe you, you automated the step of the uh, ITR being uploaded. But when you look at it as a digital journey with all the OCR, ICR technologies, I could as well read the values from an ITR without the need for a human intervention, feed that value into my underwriting engine, which can then tell me the declared income, is it sufficient to be met by, by the premium? Now, when you digitally reimagine the whole thing, you see that the sum total of individual gaps that you fill in versus when you do it entirely, the entire one is what gives you the true transformation. The third stage is, is important for everyone to understand is that when you do this, you have just created the strong foundation. Like they say, if you want to build a hundred story tall tower, you have to go six story down to create a basement from the ground, right? It's something like that. When you do this, you will realize that the ecosystem of various applications that you develop, whether it be a mobile app, whether it be a tab based app, whether it be a URL or portals, by whichever name that you call. I love to use the word called empowering tools. When you try to create the set of empowering tools, they actually rely for that information on the single bottom layer of the strong foundation that you built in, which is the end to end process. And your entire back end engine is ready to satisfy the needs of the front end tool. This is a third step in the journey, which is extremely critical. More often than not, this is one area where many of them, uh, many of the people commit a mistake. People look at a great fancy UX IX and say, this is a fantastic app. You click on the app. It looks at your face and allows you a login. Great. And after that, what you need to do, you have to enter 40 pieces of information and then you'll get right. a message that it will get back to you shortly. Right. Now, is that what you intended in the tool? The customer was happy to look at the face and login. A, mm. a user ID less login, right? Mm. But did it solve the problem? No. Yeah. So you need that integration. So the layer of foundation, the layer of the UX, which I love to call string of pearls. So imagine mm -hmm. the, the, the string of pearls is a set of the application systems and tools and apps. And the, the thread that connects are the interfaces that connects it with the backend. When you have that, you have a, not only a robust solution, you have a scalable and sustainable solution. And that is what we did. So when we did our sales application, we did that, which enabled us to today get more than 95% of our policy login coming from there. Mm -hmm. We created a robust CRM, both as a front end and a back end engine, which enabled us to say that any interaction made by any customer from any source, whether it be portal, whether it be through an app, whether it be through a walk in in a branch or a call center, you get a single view of the customer. So this is so very critical for any person who embarks on a journey. So in short, first understand the rework the entire end to end, reimagine it. Mm -hmm. Second, 
understand what is the digital solution or a solution to manage it end to end. Use the combination of an AI, ML, engines, as well as your standard workflow or systems which can integratedly work. Then the layer that goes to the entire world is an app layer or a portal layer or a call center communication layer, which will enable you to be able to satisfy the end-to-end -end journey in, as you rightly said, in a frictionless manner. Correct. Right. So that, that looks like a very comprehensive end-to-end -end strategy to weave digital in the uh, in the entire fabric of your organization. So let now, me give you one example at the hmm. at the cost of taking a few minutes. No, that's uh, okay. People generally people generally look at and some of the viewers might be wondering. You know, everybody hmm. gives a new business example. What happens after that? Because a life insurance contract is a long term claims is a critical piece Correct. of the whole settlement. So when we reimagined our whole claims process. We had claims automation. We had a good amount of claims automation. When we reimagined, we found out, now what happens if somebody wants to directly send some information through a branch? How are my CRM is integrated to a claim system? From a claim system, can I? how is my investigator engine integrated? So you would like to investigate certain claims. Based on certain types of claims, can I seamlessly immediately give it to an uh, in investigator? As if he gets a mail in his mailbox saying that you have a new case to investigate. Traditionally, nobody had thought about it. People thought about sending a mail or calling an investigator and asking him to investigate. So when we did this ecosystem, so today, investigator does gets to know what to be investigated through a rule engine. He yes. completes the investigation and just uploads the whole report, including artifacts, where I have it back with me on a real time basis with all the trail records tomorrow for any discussion or any analysis. So these are also the thing when you look at, and I just thought I should bring this up because traditionally, right. uh, you know, we all love to jump first into a new business acquisition example, uh, mm -hmm. but that's what we did across new business. And what so is the kind of benefit that you're you're seeing? How has it improved your uh, claim settlement ratio? Up? So for what example, you... so for example, it has enabled, it has drastically improved our fraud detection. So, for example, we have algos which tells us based on the parameters entered and the type of the policy, the type of background, etc. Should this case be referred to risk investigation? What is the level of seriousness in that? Second, mm -hmm. it has helped to cut down a lot of turnaround time between the time we used to give it to an investigator, the investigator does. And if he has a query, he will generally they may not write a mail, they may call you, and then they call you, you may not be available. Now, all of that interaction is to a medium. Now, what has happened is it has looked at our overall end-to-end -end timeline. It's actually crunched by more than half. Okay. Without compromising a bit on quality, without compromising a bit on our risk assessment ability, as well as the need to be able to settle the money to the claimant, which has reduced by half. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, Mr. Ingar, um, digital-led uh, creative disruption can help break the physical and geographical boundaries and help uh, an organization become digital. Uh, it can also reduce the time to execute transactions on uh, offers and uh, even services. It can help an uh, insurer run an agile operational unit. So what are some of the ways uh, you think it has reduced the cost of operations and expansion for uh, a company like Reliance Nippon Life Insurance? insurance as you very rightly said the first thing digital has done it has broken the geographical or physical barriers my branch is not necessarily a branch made up of four walls my branch is suddenly the mobile in front of me or a laptop in front of me where i can use to interact anytime anywhere and in the pace at which i choose now, this is the core essence of the subsequent things. Now, what has it led? It has led organization to explore new geographies, new revenue models, new sales model. Now, what has that led to? That has led to increased revenue and the cost. And like in any of the cost of operation, a large part of the cost of operations is fixed operation. The higher the transaction, the higher the volume, the per unit cost subsequently comes down. So that was one way the cost of operations came down. The second is 
automating the whole uh, operational area, like the examples of what I mentioned to you on claims or policy servicing, or uh, servicing through a fingertip uh, using your portals, apps. Now, this enables a self-service model. What it means is without having to depend on any of my resources, you can independently get your transaction or let me call it, get your service request addressed immediately without any difficulty. This further brings down the cost of operations. Third and most important, uh, which uh, I have found and I have been able to demonstrate in, in various organizations, uh, various forums is when you capture data at source using digital, what do you do? You ensure that everything that you were earlier capturing from a physical form is now 100% available as a data, which was not the case earlier. So traditionally, if you used to capture 70 pieces of information, you would probably capture only 40 pieces. Now, what's happened is I am allowing uh, a data creation where every piece of data is available on a digital form. Now, this has suddenly opened up a huge data mine for me to be able to mine that and get some more insights. For example, if I have got a medical questionnaire, a classic example would be in underwriting, you would ask, how has been your, uh, uh, you know, have you, do you have earlier policies from any other insurance company? Or a common question would be, uh, is there an early death in your family? You know, how is your parents' health, your health, your spouse's health? These used to be typically looked at only at the time of underwriting and seldom mm -hmm. used afterwards. Correct. Now with whole thing being on digital, this is available as a data point. Mm -hmm. Now, if I have captured an information which says my father is 55 and is healthy, potentially it also opens me an opportunity for a cross sell to try and sell an annuity policy to his family. Now, what is used as an underwriting risk also becomes an enabler for a cross-sell opportunity with no additional cost and without having to disturb the customer to say, I want more information from you. And this is what I see as the single biggest or one of the biggest factor that a data repository can give and is giving, which in turn reduces your overall cost of operations. Mm -hmm. These are the three stages in which the whole cost of operations comes down. Of course, you have traditional way of saying, you know, if you send it on a soft copy, you don't need to send it on a physical, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not dwelling into that. That's like uh, taking coal to Newcastle. Uh, it's known to everybody. This is a dimensions where uh, organizations are working. Some of them have been successful and uh, it would be good to see everybody being largely successful because that's what is the real the real value of uh, digital into play. Correct, correct. So, uh, Mr. Iyengar, you alluded to this point um, in in your response. Um, and historically, insurance companies have been sitting on huge amounts of data uh, since there are interactions, periodic interactions with the customers at different stages of the the policy. Um, so, how do you see insurers leveraging customer data to create new revenue streams for their business now? How is digital helping you bring that sort of a creative disruption? Indeed, you are you are right, uh, Sneha, when you mentioned on sitting on pile of information, I would say tons of information. And this was for a variety of reasons, uh, traditionally not explored much. Uh, a true data warehouse came into this industry probably only six or seven years after the after the whole private industry came up. What probably was there was a data mart sitting under the garb of or a disguise of data warehouse. Uh, the, when the real data warehouse and analytics started stepping in, and this is what many or almost today, most of the insurance company levels of maturity, different levels of maturity have been using. That. How does it help? But first, the traditional, the first quick kill, I always say is cross sell. The second one, uh, which later on went is upsell. Now, if I know your medical history, if I know your profile, if I know your premium paying pattern, if I know whether you are a businessman or a salaried employee, people started getting into offering pre underwritten insurance product, which is also sometimes called as guaranteed insurance of a policy. Mm -hmm. 
you pay the money and you just say yes to this question there are only three or four questions we will issue your policy this is another big uh, advantage that came using data warehouse and using the digital layer when ai and ml started further maturing i'm talking about the journey from 2015 16 onwards where ai ml started getting implemented or really used uh, and i would like to add only one point before you know people jump into pre 2015 or post 2015 uh, and if then analysis is not an ai engine an ai engine is far far superior than that yes. where it can make its own subjective decisions and it learns itself right that's mm -hmm. a fundamental difference between any underwriting engine or a standard engine versus an ai or an ml solution now what happened is when this started coming in the analytics and inferences became more sharper for example from the data warehouse you could also see that if a particular agent has exhibited certain characteristics like there are a slightly higher percentage of death claim from his portfolio i can use it as an alert to check his remaining portfolio mm -hmm. it opens up we have to understand that revenue generation is one aspect of it revenue protection is equally important and many a times mm -hmm. revenue protection becomes very important if i am able to identify a potential fraud for some mm -hmm. reason i may not have detected at the time of issuance of a policy but i am able to do it using these mm -hmm. tools in the journey maybe in the next 6 months 5 months and able to get an alert and able to analyze i can weed out i'm also protecting revenue or revenue leakage or revenue yes. loss whichever term that we might want to use so revenue generation is one side mm -hmm. of the uh, like to call as a financial background person one side of the balance sheet revenue leakage to be stopped is another side of the balance sheet and that's what digital and when i say digital here in this context is very specifically the various automation plus ai plus ml enabled these improvements or these leap frog to happen within the industry and and trust me we are just scratching the surface we have not yet gone into the area of uh, speech to behavioral analytics any call that comes into call center there are solutions available the technology is there how can you convert speech into alerts which are behavioral alerts and then can tell the person to say that your response has to be in this way okay. now some of them have started trying to use around it uh that in the, that industry itself is very nascent there's a lot of development that's happening and some of the developments are real excellent developments that are happening and that's the area where i see will enable uh in the good old days in the paper world people used to talk about tickle feed a uh, trickle feed a trickle feed is nothing but every time a customer calls you you get some information okay. and at that moment when the call gets completed it's all lost now you have using these tools you can not only get that trickle information and be able to tell what to do with that trickle information and how long is that expiry date of that trickle feed information because we need to remember that every piece of information comes with an expiry date mm -hmm. if you don't use the information before the expiry date correct. the information is as as useless so, as a paper in a paper basket correct correct that's the whole essence of the digital age and everything has to be real time so so going forward how do you see uh, ai and ml tools uh, helping create sustainable and unique revenue generating models in the industry what is the pattern that you're seeing the trends that you're uh, seeing one of the biggest area where uh, people are seeing uh, people are implementing it and some of the successes are seen though early days is using real time ai ml to be able to offer instant product gratification when i say instant product gratification when i am speaking to a customer and the behavioral uh, input that tells me is that the customer is a happy customer with me and he is in a certain life stage now which is different from the life stage when he bought a policy i can be able to identify and tell the customer and propose a new product for him now all i need to remember as a call center executive or a seller is what product to say to him the rest all is done by ai mm -hmm. it identifies the 
uh, the tickle feed information. It identifies the uh, you know customer satisfaction rate. It identifies what therefore based on the life stage is my uh, data that I need to mine. What product he has bought and therefore what is the product that I can upsell to him. All that it takes is like if I'm a call center executive, I might enter only two pieces of information. That's it. Without mm -hmm. losing the focus and attention of speaking to the customer. And this is one big area where I see uh, AI are driving a lot around on that. Second is on the area of service. Uh, the biggest factor is on customer retention. Mm -hmm. Many of the customers do sometimes uh, under the influence of uh, a seller or a friend could take some sudden decision in the world where we live by we live and decide everything by a Google or a social media app. Sometimes the flip side is someone would say, uh, you know, better invest the money here. Okay. And if a person calls you up, he's not fully convinced on surrender, but he calls you up to get the information. Using an AI, if I can identify the a few key points as he speaks, it can prompt back to the caller, or in this case, the call center person or a branch official or the seller to say, highlight these points so that it reinforces the product that he has bought and thereby the customer is convinced, maybe I heard wrong. What these guys are telling me is right. I should continue with my policy. Right. So I see this as one big area, for example, on claims uh, service. The, of course, the other area is on claims. When an interaction comes up, it enables the AI not just enables to uh, detect a fraud. On a positive side, it also says if you take a decision on a borderline case between a repudiation of a claim to a payment of a claim, if I take a decision to pay the claim, what is the extra risk that I'm carrying? And am I taking the right decision? The inputs that come from the AI and ML tool go a long way in a for a claims assessor to take that final decision faster, more accurate. Right. Uh, now, Mr. Iyengar, in the BFSI industry, uh, blockchain is being viewed like a great solution uh, that is looking for problems to solve. And organizations want to throw problems at it and see what sticks. Uh, can blockchain herald the creative disruption in the insurance industry? What are some of the areas in uh, life insurance, non-life insurance, and health insurance where you think it could have a definitive impact? A very valid point, and this is the topic of the need of the hour. Uh, you would see that uh, blockchain is in most circles the buzzword. Uh, probably Correct. next only to AI, ML, and RPA. Right. Uh, this right. is the next buzzword. Blockchain has huge promises. Blockchain, uh, so the biggest example that everybody knows, probably uh, 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 anyone who knows money knows that cryptocurrency's backbone is blockchain, right? Okay. So uh, it is as prevalent and as famous as, uh, as possible. Having said that, it's important for us to peel this onion to find out what is applicable where. Like they say, one shirt size doesn't fit all. Mm -hmm. Same, a blockchain in its in its concept may not be the answer everywhere or can be an answer everywhere, but degrees vary. Now, coming to an insurance industry, the, the way and blockchain, first let us talk about the business nature of business or the diversity of the, the types of product and the lines of business. You have three main arms, the life, the non-life. Some people call it general insurance. Maybe in India, it's called general insurance. In the Western world, it is called PNC and so on. So the non-life and the third is health insurance. And again, in this case, some of the, some of the countries, some of the geographies, health insurance becomes also a part of the non-life. But these are, from an Indian context, there are three clear- Three broad pillars. Now, in a life insurance industry, you would find that primarily a life insurance is a long term contract. So people don't buy a policy for one year, two years and three years. People buy a policy for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years or for life. So that would that means the level of collaboration, the periodicity of collaboration drastically reduces or 
is available or applicable at one or two or three critical touch point. For example, at a new business stage for risk underwriting. I might like to know if somebody has applied for a policy in my company, has he applied for a policy in some other insurance company mm. and which is not disclosed to me. A blockchain is a great example. To be so fraud able. detection at the stage of a customer onboarding. Indeed, that is one. The yeah. second one is the second milestone or a touch point would be like, for example, a person has applied for a surrender of a policy mm. at your place. And, so, and you find out that there is also a new policy bought from some other company. It will give you a different type of an alert. But alert would be that he is being potentially misled or being convinced that maybe the other company is better than this company. So you yeah. might want to clarify to the customer in a different way. It might also give, depending on the levels of collaboration, maturity, etc. The other company may also want to be red alerted to say that probably he is a shopper and who would stay with an insurance company for only one or two years. So mm -hmm. third area, good of collaboration. When it comes to claims, when you get a claim and you find that this claim says a death certificate has got certain different attributes, let's say a date of death. And in some other insurance company, a, a death certificate is given, which is different or a reason is different. Then you know what is to be done. There is also a fraud alert. There is also a, a risk alert. It was beyond a particular point, a risk is necessarily not equal to fully fraud. A fraud risk is, it can be good or bad, but you have to identify. A fraud is something that you know that there is something very clearly suspicious in that area. Now, life insurance has these two or three to begin with, which is there. And, and as you discover more, you'll probably get more. Non-life insurance on the other hand, the spectrum is huge from uh, probably insuring a motorcycle or a cycle. And, all and also it's a short-term product as well. Indeed. It's a short-term product. You would have one, two, three, four years. Uh, mm -hmm. Not definitely not as much as a life insurance policy Correct. by any other. Mm -hmm. The second one is by, by when you say it's a short term, it automatically means that I tend to buy, renew my policy. By, so the opportunities for checking are more. Mm -hmm. Similarly, many of these are also cross-border policies. For example, an export-import insurance, a cargo mm -hmm. marine insurance, or, or uh, 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 international risk related insurance Correct. now so it you can transcend that, geopolitical that, borders as well exactly it transcends mm -hmm. geopolitical border where you will have to collaborate with different institutions different entities mm -hmm. different individuals and bring together the terms and condition on real time so that you can cut down on your uh, on your time the best mm -hmm. example on blockchain on non-life which has been proven is on the cargo insurance where uh, you know, many a times the joke used to be that by the time the cargo lands in the destination is where the insurance policy gets issued. Now, using blockchain, this just is a matter of hours. Even before the ship leaves the port, the, the, the insurance is there. Now, so there is a huge because the industries are quite a lot in non-life. Okay. Third comes is, is a health insurance, which falls in between a life and a non-life, where you would have a four-way collaboration between a third-party administrator, the TPA, the insurance company, the insured and the hospitals and to do it in such a way, whether they're the primary uh, driver would be to say, how can I seamlessly settle claims? You don't want a person who is there in the hospital to be waiting for so long just to figure out whether this claim is being accepted or what is the situation. This is where this collaboration. So blockchain, in my view, the, the, the short answer, great opportunity. The greatness is not uniform. Depending on the component of life, non-life, and health, the, the, the depth of applicability will change. However, we all have to understand whatever I said is also, is also probably just half of what the blockchain is capable of. Every, mm -hmm. every few months, we are discovering newer innovation mm -hmm. within the blockchain. Newer interaction that blockchain is able to collaborate with various other ecosystems. Now, the blockchain itself is getting enriched which means that multiple use cases may soon start becoming a reality mm -hmm. right so so this is how my view on uh, on a blockchain would be uh, rather and than when you know, jumping for one okay. answer saying it's great or it's bad 
Correct, correct. Now, uh, at the ground level, what do you see uh, in terms of awareness or the state of adoption of uh, blockchain uh, among Indian insurers? How um, high is the learning curve? Where do you see, how do you see them adopting? Do you see that interest level and uh, it's not really, uh, you know, translating into adoption? What is the kind of uh, trend that you are seeing? So it's a, it's a bit of a mixed bag, uh, to be candid. So, for example, there are already a couple of examples within the non-life industry where uh, you can call it as a sample project or a pilot project uh, yes. on, on certain lines of business have been done by a small set of uh, like non-life insurers coming together and using blockchain to work on. So, A, the answer is there is a high level of interest. Now, the high level of interest translating into actual projects and doing, again, depends on these three industries. Now, within the life insurance industry, we have been also discussing with multiple uh, insurers as a consortium of insurers. All the insurers had come together and had been exploring options on blockchain. There has been some progress on that area, though it is, it is pretty uh, slow. Uh, however, I see an emergence of speed in this area, especially with now the angle of insure tech and fintech also being available into this whole ecosystem. So the way I see is it is not just the insurance companies coming together and doing a blockchain. If I can add a few insure techs who can, who can, whose platform I can use to, to make my services available to my customer, or I can use certain fintechs to make it possible. It's not that I necessarily have to collaborate only with a set of insurers. Okay. Now you see that the pie is becoming bigger. The, so, so there is an interest. Uh, general insurance industry or the non-life in industry has taken um, as progress much faster, as I would say, compared to a life industry on the blockchain. Uh, so th there are also discussions within the health insurance industry on that space. Uh, and the levels of progress, to be frank, are different amongst the three of them. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, now, Mr. Aingar, uh, insurtechs are heralding a very different kind of creative disruption in the insurance industry. Uh, you know, they are bringing in new business models, uh, ensuring, uh, bring, ca carving new niches, and, uh, you know, uh, insuring the underinsured uh, in a very different way. So uh, how do you see insurers collaborating with insurtechs to foster greater creative disruption in this space? So there is uh, there is already a lot of collaboration that happens at different level insurtech, whether it be for platform for uh, uh, payment solutions or risk assessment solutions or uh, collaborating to understand the the financial uh, worthiness of a person by touch basing upon let's say his other surrogates so there is already certain level of collaboration that happens however i see a very dramatic growth of the insured techs in this space in the coming years to the likes that we have not seen you would have seen uh, uh, there are certain companies that have emerged out in the western world in in, in especially in north america and some lemonade, Europe, lemonade, for example. Yeah, yeah. Metro so Mile. lemonade is there. There is Metro Mile and Nip. Nip. There are quite a lot of people. Insure tech has become the insurance company. So I would call insure tech insurance. I would like uh, I love to coin that word insure tech insurance, where insure tech is not just into the collaboration level, they are into the driver's seat. And now what happens is the way that you offer a product, design a product offer a product and service a product is quite of a different scale than the way that we traditionally look at it. So InsureTech, uh, I am very gungo on this whole InsureTech space, uh, especially as I see technology driving insurance. And okay. it is therefore a natural extension to see InsureTechs uh, being in the driver's seat, insurtech insurance being there, and changing the way the, the we look at insurance. There is also a good amount, there is also another model where leading insurance companies have collaborated with a startup or you know 
uh, uh, doing a hosting of uh, startups uh, mm -hmm. and incubating them where the solutions that have been delivered first gets used by the insurance company and then there is a you know a, a period after which that can be going out to the market and insure tech can sell it out in the market or the insure tech then if it is so if it's so great success tool the insure tech itself becomes a subsidiary of the insurance company that's another dimension that we see of how this this area is something that you would see some of the largest insurance companies globally are working on that to me, that's another flavor of InsurTech. Rather than just mm -hmm. looking at InsurTech traditionally as a separate standalone, the InsurTech takes its dimensions from the third angle. So these are three deviation, uh, sorry, three varieties of InsurTech that I see. Today, maybe the first variety is the majority. Uh, very soon, I would not be surprised if the second and third also takes a good share in the total. Mm -hmm. Right. Um so uh, at this stage, I'd like to take a question from one of our viewers. He wants to know, while we've discussed this um, in AI and uh, you know blockchain, but he wants to know what are some of the key priorities that uh, and trends that insurance companies will see over the next uh, one to two years? The key priorities that the insurance companies will look at are, number one, how can I fully reach the digitally, uh, reach the newer geographies at a lower cost of reaching there, which would mean I need to have end-to-end -end digitization with the AI, ML, etc. that we spoke about and automated intelligence being built in that can help me to reach bigger market. Second is a large, given the present COVID situation and scenario of every comp have the more claims, etc. would be to a large amount of investment using on fraud, claims analytics and better risk management or strengthening certain areas of risk management is another area where I see a lot of focus and, and investments going in. Third is the area about how to strengthen or deepen the existing distribution channels and so that the distribution channels, each distribution channel can approach the customer in, in its unique way whereby I love to call this terminology as n equal to one, uh, where each customer is different and you have to approach him differently and you, the product proposition or service proposition itself will be different. How do we move to n equal to one? This is what is a journey that is going to be sharpened. The, uh, the, the way of traditionally, uh, you know, sending out 100 people out on the out and then trying to get the business will be there. I'm not saying it's, it's very important. It's, it's a backbone. It's almost all the companies, if not all, it's a backbone. This will be largely also augmented by, by the second one that I mentioned to you so that the revenue streams can be further opened up. Customer feels that this is a product that is tailor-made for him and this is a product or service that is well-suited for me and therefore I should buy it. These are the three areas that I see. Right, right. Uh, Mr. Aingar, in these last couple of minutes that we have with you, um, I'd like to understand from you that uh, you've moved from an IT leadership role, from a CIO role to the COO role. And uh, in these uh, BFSI circle, it seems like a logical transition for uh, successful CIOs to move uh, to this new career trajectory. Um, how do you see the CEO role as a logical transition after the CIO role? And what did you do differently as a COO as opposed to a CIO? Okay. And uh, an interesting question. This is my personal journey. And the way I see that I saw it, a CIO is a better placed, if not best placed, to understand the business than any of his peers. Okay. He's actively involved in all the stages from strategy to implementation. He would be there in the strategy discussion. The very the helicopter strategy, vision of his business yeah, as well that he has. Indeed. And that enables him to understand why something is being done rather than just doing it. While he's directly responsible for design, development, maintenance of the technology system, this helicopter view and working, looking at the overall view of the various components puts him in a natural sweet spot to be taking the role of a CEO. In fact, I've always been of the opinion that uh, 
and we spoke about InsurTech, we spoke about some of these examples. Uh, a CIO is also a best place person for the role of a CEO. When InsurTech is insurance, insure technology runs insurance in many of these places, in the new gen insurance companies, the mm -hmm. technology is at the driver's seat. Correct. The CIO is all the more best placed to be mm -hmm. able to uh, even play that role very effectively. Uh, so, and for me, some of the, uh, for me, the I had always looked and uh, having worked in various uh, positions, whether it is in operations, underwriting claims, uh, uh, apart from technology, also in digital and analytics. What it gave me was to understand the business more deeper gave me a great opportunity and that when i was a cio enabled me to come up with solutions for the business that were very successful and as i moved into the role of ceo the uh, it enabled me to also look at both the business part of it with more focus and apply the knowledge of technology digitization analytics and look at a business problem as it comes to say that, hey, what can a technology do? What can a digitization do? What cores are the things that are there in the external world? What can I solve? And what is it that I need to look at from outside to be able to solve the problem? And I think that uh, that has been my change in outlook. Uh, and that's what helped me to create uh, more successful initiatives and successful uh, stories uh, uh, on all the projects initiatives uh, that I had taken and, and and learning is a journey and 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 as long as you are glued to the problem and being able to understand it and apply your first principles the most important thing that I always tell people is irrespective of manual, automation, digitization, maybe tomorrow it's all robotics. First principles of any industry, first principles of anything will not change. Correct. These Absolutely. are the core. These are, for example, in an insurance, it's all about making the customer understand what are his needs, understand from him. Empathy, being able to be able to be there with him. These are some things, just to, if I pick up from one area, these are first principles that never change. And as long as we keep this first principle and modify uh, the, the subsequent components, whether it is from manual to automation, automation to advanced digital, digital to AI and AI to robotics and whatnot, uh, that is what, if I started off this whole session with a statement on creative destruction, that's the completion of the journey of creative destruction the one thing that remains constant is the first principles. That's so true, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Iyengar. It was an absolute delight talking to you, as it always is. Uh, you gave us a very detailed and comprehensive view of the way in which you're seeing the digital-led creative disruption in your organization, uh, in your industry, and uh, the, the trends that you're seeing around AI, ML, blockchain, automation, and how it's uh, helping amp up the game for insurance companies. Thank you so much for spending time with us and sharing your insights. Thank insight. you, Sneha. Thank you, Sneha, to you and everybody in ETCIO. Uh, have a great day. Thank you so much, sir. A big thank you to our viewers for tuning in today and sharing your questions with Mr. Iyengar. We'll be back next Thursday with another interesting session of ETCIO Leaders Live. Follow us on social media to find out who's our guest for the next week. Until next time, this is Sneha Jha signing off.